So this is Stanford where the weather is much better, and that's, we have about a 3,000 foot mountain between us and the uh, ocean, which is just on the other side of those mountains, which is why our weather is so much better than in San Francisco. The mountains keep the Pacific climate away from us. And that's the undergraduate campus right there. The hospital sits right over here. So the most important thing that I'll say in this entire talk, and you've heard allusions to this a little bit in some of the prior talks, is you do not just take out every nodule. So the way that, um, that these studies were successful and that they reduced risk was by having very strict criteria about what nodules you follow, what nodules you, you uh, and almost all of them you follow, um, I should say. And it's even with these very strict criteria that you're not just jumping in and taking out every nodule, you still have almost every tumor remaining at stage one. So that's really the key to this. There is certainly no rush to remove pure ground glass opacities. Some of them will never be removed. Some of them uh, will turn out to be benign, of course, and just go away. And a lot of them will probably end up being, you know, what we would call pseudotumors, although I think that remains really to be seen, and it depends which population you're talking about. But just as an example, these are the Fleischner criteria, which many people use, um, which many people are using to decide how to follow nodules. And there will be some things on these recommendations that, as a surgeon, might strike you as a little bit crazy. For example, they split them into solid nodules and subsolid nodules, including ground glass nodules. And I circled, even for a solid nodule in a high-risk individual, they're only recommending a CT for an 8-millimeter nodule at somewhere between 6 and 12 months. So that three-month scan you get to make sure it's not a rapidly growing thing, mm -mm, you're not supposed to do that. And then if that first one at 6 months or 12 months is, is shows no change, then you're not supposed to get another one for 18 to 24 months. So, and even with criteria like this, these are all stage one when you take them out. So that's, that's the thrust of what you have to remember. And it can be scary to, do, to sort of be that way as a surgeon, but that's what you have to do. So if you're practicing thoracic surgery in the safest, most appropriate way, you're going to be watching a lot of lung nodules over time. And I have this conversation every single Tuesday in my clinic. Mrs. Smith, this nodule may very well prove eventually to be a little tiny precancer, but it is not going to hurt you right now, and there is absolutely no harm and potentially a lot of good of watching it and only operating if it grows a little bit. So you don't just whack them all out. The correlation to that is all of these papers about localizing strategies and things like that, I think, are kind of overblown because if you're not taking out the nodules that don't need to come out, you don't need a lot of localization strategies. I have a very long skinny finger, which is my best localization strategy. Now maybe if your anatomy is a lot different than that, then, then maybe it's, uh, it, you might need them a little bit more often. So I'll briefly talk about these lipidic lung cancers, which at least in my population in Stanford, California, where we have a lot of Chinese people or people of Asian background, most of them are ground glass or part solid. Um, so these are basically um, non-invasive pneumocyte prol proliferations with thick septi, which look like this uh, histologically, and then radiographically, we now know that they are basically in front of us. We can watch the adenocarcinoma in situ to invasive carcinoma sequence. And if I had an image that took this one back another two years, you'd probably have pure ground glass. I guess I have a pointer. You'd probably have pure ground glass, just like this part of it, here you've already got a solid component, and then a little bit later you've got a bigger solid component, and here you've got something that's almost half solid, um, which is pretty substantial and is definitely has components of invasive adenocarcinoma. Obviously, the solid correlates very highly. Uh, the solid on CT correlates very highly to invasiveness histologically, although not, it's not perfect, and the ground glass correlates very highly to non-invasive. So these occur often in non-smokers, people of Asian ancestry, women, but they also occur in Caucasians and smokers. The, the um, Asians tend to have a, an EGFR mutation, but smokers often have a KRAS mutation in something that early on is a ground glass opacity. Um, now, a solitary lipidic predominant tumor, and, and this includes literature up to three centimeters, which is pretty big, right? They rarely develop lymph node metastases. They have a five-year survival in the 90 to 100 percent range. And importantly, they're increasingly accepted as an indication for sublobar resection. These are the perfect tumors for segmentectomies, and I'll, I'll get into wedge versus segment. 
Now, before 2011, these were what people called these all BAC, right? BAC, which really was very nonspecific and didn't tell you much about it. All it meant is it had either a little ground glass in it or a little lipidic component histologically, or a big one, or the whole thing was ground glass, you didn't know what they were talking about. So in 2011, the IASLC, American Thoracic Society, and European Respiratory Society came up with this. So you should know this cold if you're, gonna, if you're a thoracic surgeon. Adenocarcinoma in situ, pure non-invasive. Minimally invasive, less than five millimeters non-invasive. Lipidic predominant, greater than five millimeters non-invasive, and lipidic is the predominant, makes up the largest component of the tumor. Um, I kind of think of these two as things that aren't really quite lung cancers yet and really don't have a chance to spread, and I start to think about these more seriously like I think about regular old lung cancers. Um, but today, if we're talking about screening detected things, we're often talking about things like this, right? I would call these ground glass, both of them, although this one's looking a little darker, isn't it? And then here a thing like this is a pure ground glass nodule. So what do you do about those? And then we'll talk a little bit about solid ones also. So the questions, when, you resect, when do you resect them? What type of resection? What's the exact technique? How do you, uh, you know, do these sort of minute to minute? So is resection even necessary for an, entire, for a, uh, an entirely ground glass nodule, which we know is pretty close to definitively going to be pure in situ on pathology? If it's less than a centimeter, no. You should not be taking out pure ground glass opacities that are less than a centimeter in size. They are always. Uh, Noguchi A or B, which is the earlier classification system of these sort of non-invasive tumors, which are 100% cure, they're 100% cured. They don't have lymph nodes. Now, when you get to about over two centimeters, this is pure ground glass, they do start to, uh, it starts to worry me a little bit. Some of the literature would suggest it's okay to not take it out. I I'm really not okay with that. Um, at Stanford, I've been impressed, and we're in the middle of trying to put a paper together about this, that things, when, when they get over centimeter and they're pure GGO radiographically, often they, they are read out as invasive on the path. I'm not sure the pathologists are all doing exactly the same thing all over the world, so that's a little bit of a problem. Remember, some of them will be benign. Some may never progress. That is, they're, suit, they're kind of in the, in the spectrum, but, they, but they're pseudotumors. And also, many of them are multifocal very many, we've written a few publications about this in the EGFR mutant patients are multifocal, and it's nice to kind of get a sense of how those are progressing or not progressing all of the nodules before you jump in on, on one of them. So if you're going to resect these, we're talking about it, part solid nodules, is sublobar resection appropriate? So if you look at it by pathology where they took them out and they were pure in situ, 100% are cured, and these are almost all wedge resections. This is from, a, from Asian uh, studies for the most part. How about by what's called tumor shadow disappearance rate? So many studies that look at if you take the tumor and then you switch to your sort of mediastinal or soft tissue windows, how much of the tumor disappears? So here you see the ground grass part is gone and the solid part stays. So basically it's another way of saying what, how, what percent is solid. So if it's less than 50% solid, then they have 100% cure. Again, these are almost all wedge resections. Few segments thrown in. If they are more than 50% solid, then you start to have significant, almost like an old-fashioned lung cancer kinds of, uh, kinds of results. And these sort of show similar, similar things. Even with multifocal disease, so even if you have one of these patients, and often when you have somebody with a part solid nodule, you start staring at their CAT scan, you go, oh, there are some other nodules, and you start to see other, other ground glass opacities. And even if you have a bunch of them, and we studied up patients with up to seven, the cure rate is basically dependent on that one tumor. So we adopted a policy of doing whatever the appropriate resection is for the main tumor, taking out other little ones if we can, and then following those patients, and the, and the cure rates are about 93%. So this is not M1 disease when they have several other GGOs with one dominant tumor. Um, solid tumors, I want to make the point, are completely different. I think you have to think of them in a, in, a, as a, in a whole different way. And here's just one of the studies that show how aggressive even small solid tumors can be. So this, I think, is, I guess this was from Wash U. If you take T1N0 clinical non-small cell lung cancer, only 58% of them are pathologically T1N0, which is pretty amazing. And 
18% of them had lymph node metastases. Now, size is important, as one centimeter was much lower than that. I think it might have been, it might have been six or seven percent, and two centimeter is like 12 percent. But, um, but a lot of the invasive ones are important. And again, this is a paper Mark Burry, my partner, and I published. Even if they have just a little tiny bit of ground glass radiographically, even less than 25 percent, they have a substantially better survival than a pure solid tumor less upstaging at surgery, et cetera. So we're, but pure solid tumors, I think you have to take very significantly. Now, there's no randomized data on segmentectomy versus wedge, whether you're talking about solid tumors or part solid tumors. This is probably the best study that, that I've seen, and I think it's almost all solid tumors, although they don't really differentiate, but it's old enough that there, we weren't seeing or recognizing a lot of GGO-type lesions at that time. And there's a pretty substantial difference here in a well-matched, non-randomized group. Local recurrence is three times higher if you do a wedge instead of a segment. And cancer-specific survival substantially higher, but not quite meeting statistical significance in a small study. So I think if you have a solid, old-fashioned solid lung cancer, um, and you're thinking that the patient should have a sublobar resection for whatever reason that might be, whether they have you know, cardiopulmonary impairment, or there's another nodule on the other side that you think you may have to deal with, I think a segmentectomy is better than a wedge resection. And it has to be a real segmentectomy. You know, there's no cheating. It may not happen in this country, but in the United States, I've seen plenty of cases where I later saw a patient and someone had done basically a giant wedge resection and then called it a segmentectomy in their operative report, and it's clearly not a wedge resection. So what's the advantage? It clearly was not a segmentectomy. What's the advantage? of a segmentectomy over a wedge resection, well, number one, you tend to get a wider margin, although not always, depending on where the thing is located. But secondly, you get that intersegmental lymph node, which is sort of the sump node for that, for that segment. And you should be taking out that intersegmental lymph node and freezing it. And if it's positive, the patient should get a lobectomy if you think they can tolerate it. Um, so, um, so individual ligation, dissecting out that intersegmental node at the, at the bronchial crotch, and, and going on. I'm not a big believer in individual segments of the, of the upper lobe or of the basilar segments of the lower lobe, because I feel like at some point it starts to become close to a, to a wedge resection in terms of the margin part of it, at least. But in, if you're talking about the main segmentectomies, a full basilar segmentectomy, all, all the basilar segments, or a superior segmentectomy, or an apical triseg or lingulectomy, I feel like it's a much better operation for a tumor that actually has some chance of spreading to the lymph nodes, better than a wedge. So, am I okay? I have a couple minutes left? Yeah. So, kind of a summary approach. If you're looking at a CT scan, how do you decide what's the best operation for, for that individual patient? For a less than two centimeter pure GGO, uh, let's start up here. Uh, anything greater than three centimeters, whether it's solid or GGO or part, I, I think you can't get a decent margin on a three centimeter tumor unless you do a lobectomy. And I do a lobectomy unless they just can't talk, you really think they can't tolerate it. It's pretty rare that somebody can't tolerate a lobectomy. Less than two centimeters, pure GGO or less than five millimeter solid component, which again, I said is pretty close to a pure GGO in, in rate of metastases. Um, wedge it if the, you can get a margin of at least a centimeter. Um, and then I do a very simple lymph node sampling, sort of the nodes that would be likely to be involved. For example, right upper lobe, wedge, I take, will like take the level four and the level seven, just a single node, freeze it. As long as those nodes are negative, then that's what I do. And in fact, I could tell you that for this group of tumors, I've never seen a positive lymph node. I've thought about just stopping doing the node sampling. Greater than two centimeters with a greater than five, uh, sorry, less than two centimeters with a greater than five millimeter component, but less than 50% solid. So the tumor shadow disappearance rate is is on the good side of 50%, then I usually do a segmentectomy if it's well positioned, and I do a systematic sampling and freeze them, or sometimes I'll just do a complete lymphadenectomy from the beginning, just because it sometimes feels quicker. Again, if you do a systematic sampling and they're positive, you've got to do a complete lymphadenectomy. And tumors that are greater than 50% solid, I typically do a lobectomy unless they're substantially uh, compromised. So if you're, he if you're setting out to do a segmentectomy, First, you got to decide, and of course, any approach is reasonable. It's nice if you can do these minimally invasively for the patients, and the patients like it. But I don't think that the 
that the, the outcome complication rates are substantially different. They're slightly different. Um, if it, is it anatomically amenable to a segment? Yes, go to the next step. Sample the nodes first and freeze them. Are they negative? Yes, next step. You're still trying to do a segment. Take out that sex mantle lymph node and freeze it. It's okay, good. Next step, you do a segment. Have the pathologist take a quick look at it. They won't tell you what percent, what percent invasive it is or anything like that, but they'll say this is a bad looking tumor. It looks poorly differentiated or it looks pretty well differentiated. And then you can stick with a segment if it's sort of well differentiated, but if it looks bad, do a lobectomy because they might have a node sitting there that you wouldn't otherwise get. So what's anatomically amenable? There are a couple studies on this. Probably the most convincing study is this one where they say the margin should be at least the diameter of the tumor for out of Pittsburgh. If the margin is greater than the tumor diameter, you get a 6% local recurrence rate, and if the margin is less than the diameter of the tumor, a 25% recurrence rate. Pretty significant. There's another study that suggests that one centimeter is okay with similar outcomes. How often do I do a VATS wedge and leave it at that? It's pretty rare, mainly because you probably shouldn't be operating on a solitary two centimeter pure GGO, less than two centimeter pure GGO. If you did, you should do a, a wedge resection, um, but you're watching a lot of these. And often when you get to two centimeters, you start to worry about the margin without a segmentectomy. So I don't do too many wedges, but it does, it, 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 there are appropriate times to do it. So localization techniques, which probably is what you thought I was going to talk about when I was given the topic for this, but I've sort of changed it up a little bit because I don't really feel that very often they're indicated. Um, here's an example of a, you know, a skyving view of a hook wire sitting in. First thing I would say about this is you can feel a lot more nodules than you think once you start getting used to feeling small nodules. You can feel them. You stare at the CT and you figure out where it is in relation to landmarks and you put your incision close enough to be able to feel it and you can feel it. Even if you can't feel it, it's usually amenable to a segmentectomy with only, you know, by study of the CT scan. Um, there are some that are close to the intersemagonal planes and those, those can be the problems. So the only reasons for a localization study are basically if they're really ground glass and they're kind of deep, again, you can usually just follow those. Or you really have very fat or very insensitive fingers. Um, if you must use uh, localization techniques, I've done this twice in my entire career if I used a localization technique. So if you must do it, one time I tried to die and it was a disaster, it was all over the place. And I couldn't tell, the whole lung was, was blue. Um, and the other time I used a fiducial, which worked uh, quite well. I don't really like the concept of the hook wire because I think it's probably more likely to get yanked out when the lung collapses, et cetera. Um, the fiducial, I could feel very easily at about a two and a half centimeter deep pure GGO that I had decided had to come out. And so I think the fiducial is a pretty good way. All of the studies of these, they all have, you know, 97, 98 percent, yeah, we found the nodule and it was great. But none of them compare it to whether they first tried to find it with a finger or with a regular old-fashioned way. So they don't prove that it's really of any use. Um, so in summary, many, maybe even most pure ground glass opacities don't be removed. Some will be benign. Some are pseudotumors. I, I would comment in the Asian population, um, we have a paper that's going to come out soon, that 100 percent of Asian women with GGOs, they turned out, that we removed, 100% turned out to be at least on the adenocarcinoma spectrum. So that's a subgroup. In Asian women, they always will turn out to be something. So the question there is how fast do they grow, how long is it safe to watch it, et cetera. Um, remove them at one to two centimeters, pure GGOs, if they're growing, because if they're growing, then, then they're probably on the adenocarcinoma spectrum, or developing a solid component. And if you get it at that size, you can probably just wedge it out. Wedge is okay if it's well positioned under two centimeters and not more than five millimeters solid. Formal segment if it's over five millimeters or, or certainly over 50% solid. Most true solid tumors, and I would say this until Nasser al Turki's trial comes out at least, and I don't know what that's going to show, but most, and I also don't know how well they're eliminating part solid tumors from the, from the study group, so that'll be very important. But if you're really talking about true solid tumors, my gut feeling is that the patients probably deserve a lobe. You know, these are smokers with standard solid lung cancer, speculated like you learned in medical school. Um, and localization devices are rarely needed, but if, if you're going to use one, I, I found in my limited experience that the percutaneous fiducials um, are useful. So thank you very much.